Yeah, in order to be married 74 years, you actually have to live forever, <laughs> or you have to get married at the age of nine. I'm a straight white, and uh, I'm coming out of the closet straight white. I don't know if we have a closet. We have more of a wine cellar. Hey, girl, I'm gonna be a little late. There's a guy in the park with his dick out. And she goes, you've already used that excuse before. There's four members of my family, and uh, I'm in fourth place. Uh, I saw this the other night. I saw a Domino's pizza being delivered to a McDonald's. That's not supposed to happen, okay? Like... The last couple of weeks before this part of the tour, I was lucky enough to be able to route the tour routed well so I could go and see my mother. It's important that I see her now as, as much as possible. It's tough now. I couldn't, even if I wanted to see her at this point, she's on a kind of a lockdown, not because of the a, a coronavirus, but because of the flu. And it's important that I get to see her because she's, uh, she's 101. So, uh... And what's really important is I want to get my hands on those drugs. Because they apparently really work. Whatever she's taken. Whew. My, my father, Sam, he passed away in, uh, in May. It, 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 I, it, it's hard to think it's, it, it's sad, of course, and I'm, I, I mourn, it, but he was 101. So you can't really say, fuck, Dad, you, you should have lived longer. <laughs> you know, 101, they have two parents who are 101. That's like, in, it's an insane kind of a lottery. It's, I mean, that's sweet of you to applaud. I did nothing. Uh, <laughs> but there's a real shot that I'm a, well, that I'm a reptile. <laughs> they were married 74 years. The, yeah, well, well the, yeah, in order to be married 74 years, you actually have to live forever, <laughs> or you have to get married at the age of nine. <laughs> well, actually, the, the secret to having a marriage that also is as successful as theirs was is they never, and I mean never, heard a word the other one said. <laughs> I'm asked from time to time, you know, how come they were able to live so long? And I, it, the reason is quite simple. It's uh, first, they, they never, this will shock you, they never went to the gym. <laughs> yeah, and those of you who didn't laugh, you know, think about that when you're doing your hot fuck yoga. <laughs> Unlike eating farm to table, they, Everything they ate, everything they ate, contained preservatives. Hence, they were preserved. <laughs> Quinoa never crossed their lips. And it shouldn't cross yours. Ancient grain, you can bite my fucking crank. That is bullshit on a stick. Where do you find an ancient grain? at the open all night ancient grain supermarket? I don't fucking think so. <laughs> hey, would you like some quinoa with your protein? Get the fuck away from my protein <laughs> with that shit. And it tastes like shit. And if you don't think it tastes like shit, there's something wrong with your fucking taste buds. <laughs> all I think about when I look at quinoa is they made sand taste better. When my mother reached mid-90s, I said, what's it like living so long? She said, I wouldn't call this living. I'd call it not dying. I'd call it overtime. She turned 100. This is absolutely true. She blew the candles out on the cake and said, nobody should live this fucking long. At 101, she blew out the candles and said, I crossed the finish line. Now I should be able to drop fucking dead. <laughs> and then we all sang uh, happy birthday. <laughs> My father, uh, 
it was a blessing. My father was a, a, a bit more upbeat, which was good. Uh, he was born on Valentine's, actually February 13th, the day before. And uh, we had a 100th birthday party on that day. The last big birthday party for him. And uh, for the big party for both of them when they could kind of really deal with that kind of energy and stuff. And uh, it, was, it was a lot. It becomes a lot after a while. Uh, I got a text from a friend. I took my father aside and I said, you know, Steve just texted and he said he's sorry he couldn't be here. But he, uh, he wanted me to kiss you, but not on the lips. <laughs> and my father, without missing a beat, went, where did he want you to kiss me? <laughs> I let that pass. <laughs> I said, it's a hundred years, Pop, and you've seen it all. Like, what wisdom can you impart? What are you thinking? What did you see? What can you conclude from all of this? And he said, the only thing I'm thinking about is tomorrow's another fucking Valentine's Day. <laughs> what am I supposed to get her this year? I said, I don't know, but you got two day free shipping. It's tough. It's, uh, we, we, we really weren't prepared for our parents to be living this long. Our parents weren't prepared to be living this long. Financially, it's tough. It's why whenever they talk about this is the greatest economy ever, they always do that. Every, every b b bunch of years, either Democrats or Republicans have, oh boy, they start blowing their own horn. The only people who ever talked about the fact that it's really a good economy. The only people who ever say it's a great economy are either um, politicians or rich people. They're the only ones who say it. <laughs> Did you ever hear somebody from the middle class go, fuck, whew, I couldn't be happier. <laughs> this is really turning out great. My 401k just had a 401k. <laughs> it's bullshit. And it's bullshit because we're not prepared for things. It doesn't matter. We don't prepare for things. We weren't prepared for what just happened. We, we put officials in place, and what do they do? <laughs> and meanwhile, meanwhile, before that shit even hit the fan, my, my parents were not, had no clue that they would live as long as they were living. And the only reason they were living as long as they lived was because I was um, able to get them 24-7 care. And I was able to get them 24-7 care because I've been able to dupe you fuckers into seeing me. <laughs> and so, and so for those of you tonight who may have stumbled in here by accident and are going, well, well I made a big fucking mistake. I just want you to know, you know, you may not enjoy the show, but because of you, my mother will live another day. <laughs> but none of us were prepared for this. None of us. Your parents weren't prepared because they put a certain amount of money aside. Your parents weren't prepared because when they were younger, people had the common courtesy to die at 65. <laughs> yes, they did. They would sing happy birthday, and then the fucker would go, I'm doing this for you, and then they'd drop dead right in the cake. <laughs> but the parents didn't put away enough money. They didn't, because they didn't expect to, this is, they put aside the money they thought they would need until they passed away, and then they kept going. <laughs> and, and so now the children who put money aside for themselves have to take out of that fund and put it toward their parents, which they should. And now who's gonna help those? Who's gonna help you out, huh? Who's gonna help you out? The kid who's still living in the basement? <laughs> Greatest economy ever. Good luck with that. <laughs> no, it's unbelievable. I tried to prepare for it. Before, the, uh, before the even assisted living was a notion for my parents, I found a place in New York, and one of the places I knew I'd live there for a, it would be where I'd live in New York City. And I would stay there. 
And so I, one of the reasons I liked it, it was a block away from an assisted living place. And I wanted to take my parents there. You know, my mother went with me. I took her. It was a great place. I said, what did you think? She said, if we lived this close to each other, within three days, one of us would be dead. <laughs> and since I'm, I don't think anything's going to kill me, I think it's going to be you. <laughs> many people say, I hear this from time to time, many people have a, a frontier mentality, even though we don't live on the frontier. And they think, but if your parents can't live at home um, or can't have assisted living, that they should live with you, the children. And whenever anybody tells me that, I usually go, you don't have my fucking mother! <laughs> Why don't you try to spend four hours with her, you fuck? I'll give you $10,000 if you make it for 20 minutes. Because <laughs> I can guarantee after 10, you'll be going, Look, uh, can you get me a flight to North Korea? Because my mother's going to break you, you piece of shit. My parents moved into the assisted living situation when they were 83. They moved in with a whole group of people who'd never been in assisted living in a place, a brand new place. It was the first time it was just opening. It was a lucky break. Finding a great place for your parents to stay is a lucky fuck break. Everybody knows that. We got very lucky. But my mother basically investigated the thing like she was a judge at the Nuremberg trials. <laughs> so it worked out great. And then they moved in and they outlived everybody. Everybody by like a fucking mile. And then they brought in new contestants. <laughs> and my parents outlived them. As a matter of fact, every so often after their dinner, they'd get up and go, bring it on! <laughs> I finally, I called up the assisted living place and said, uh, looks like my parents won the contest. <laughs> they said it wasn't a contest. I said, fuck you, this was the real survivor. <laughs> my mother is quite honestly this tall. I'm a little worried. She may not die and she may just disappear. <laughs> but one thing that might save you money, one thing I've been able to do is I've, I've moved her into a terrarium. <laughs> She's happy there, but she thinks that the tortoise is Mitch McConnell. Now I'd like to talk about race. <laughs> I'm a straight white. And uh, I'm coming out of the closet straight white. I don't know if we have a closet. We have more of a wine cellar. But sometimes, admittedly, I only see things from my straight white perspective. For example, I went to Aruba before the dark times without my significant partner, which is what Twitter makes me call my girlfriend now. And I needed somebody to rub sunblock on me. And I know what you're thinking, that's a straight white problem. But if you're a straight white, without your intimate partner, who do you ask? Another straight white? The answer is no, because we don't help each other. Do you ask the straight white's wife? Now you gotta fight the straight white. We're a jealous group. Can't ask a kid. I think Epstein ruined that for all of us. I asked my friend who's an African-American woman, I'm like, will you please rub sunblock on me? She goes, sunblock, Michael, is racist. I go, how so? She goes, it's a product, Michael, that's dedicated to keeping you white. I couldn't wrap my straight white brown. I couldn't. I couldn't wrap my straight white brain around it. And then she goes, and, and you could tell the level of racism by the SPF. 
SPF 5 is a little bit racist. SPF 40 is Nazi strength. She goes, give me one reason I should rub this sunblock on you, Michael, one reason. I go, melanoma? That was her name, Melanoma Jenkins. But I am against discrimination in all of its forms, okay? I was on the beach uh, in Aruba, same joke. And um, there's these children building a sandcastle, so I examined it very carefully because I'm a thoughtful person. And then I kicked it over with tears in their eyes. They were like, sir, why? And I was like, because you do not have any wheelchair accessible entrances. This is a castle of discrimination, you little pieces of trash. And I told that joke to an audience full of people in wheelchairs, and they actually gave it a standing ovation. So you guys have a, you guys have a lot of work to do. But to be honest, guys, um, with what's going on today, I just kind of, um, I kind of do whatever fits my own narrative. Like I have a white friend who goes, uh, standardized testing is racist. And I actually agree with that because I do not do well on my SATs. <laughs> so I go, yeah, I agree. He goes, it doesn't apply to you, Mike, because you're a straight white. I go, it does apply to me. If the test is racist and I'm not a racist, I'm not gonna do well on it. <laughs> I go, what did you get on the SATs? He goes, 1580, I missed one question. I go, good job, Hitler. <laughs> now I'd like to talk about God. <laughs> I am Catholic, anybody? <laughs> well, for the rest of you guys who are going to hell, When you're Catholic, what you do is you go to church, you light a candle, and you say a prayer. But I'm a very competitive Catholic, so before I light my candle, I blow everybody else's candle out. So I don't want God getting confused between the nonsense prayers and the ones that are very important. I think even if you're an atheist, you have to admire Jesus as a historical figure. You know, I think he was great, and I don't think he deserved his death, you know? All he did was, um, you know, cure leprosy, um, wash people's feet, and just like multiply loaves of bread and turn water into wine. I mean, the guy was a walking after party, basically. <laughs> and he did not deserve his death, you know? And you know who else didn't deserve their deaths? Um, the guys who were crucified next to Jesus. They were criminals. They were horse thieves. I'm not gonna stand up here and tell you guys that stealing a horse is the right thing to do. It's not. But it's not crucifixion wrong. Even for Roman times, that's a bit harsh. That's why in the Bible, there's so many letters to the Romans. People were writing in, dear Romans, how about you stop crucifying people for class three misdemeanors? <laughs> you ever hear of community service Romans or house arrest? Now the story goes, there's a bitter horse thief and a contrite horse thief, and we're all supposed to be like the contrite horse thief and ask for forgiveness. But I actually understand the bitter horse thief. <laughs> The bitter horse thief had a lot to be bitter about because he's being crucified with Jesus who has a huge following, even at that time, you know? So Jesus got all the headlines and Jesus got all the merch. Let's face it. I've never been wearing a cross and had someone come up to me and go, which guy was that? Was that the horse thief? Now, miss, have you been to Israel? Not yet. Well, I went over there before the dark times. <laughs> Did I learn Hebrew? No, I didn't. 
but I looked at it a lot. And the language of Hebrew just looks like somebody is repeatedly trying to draw a footstool over and over again. It just looked like footstool, half a footstool, one leg of a footstool, footstool flipped over, footstool flipped over, footstool, one leg of a footstool, flipped over footstool, half a footstool, one leg of a footstool, 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 half a footstool. I just wish you guys a happy Easter. And now Hebrew, I just wish you guys a happy Easter. I think Jesus had a bad lawyer. Because it was after his trial, you know, and he's waiting for the verdict and his lawyer comes back and goes, I have some good news and I have some bad news. Which would you like first? And Jesus goes, I'm about the good news. So give me the good news. And the lawyer goes, they've decided on crucifixion. And Jesus goes, that's the good news? What's the bad news? The lawyer goes, the bad news is the Romans have a union and the union has a contract with the state to perform the crucifixion. But they do not have a contract with the state to carry the cross to the crucifixion site. <laughs> Jesus goes, why are you telling me this? The lawyer goes, they want to pay you a non-union wage to carry the cross, you know? Jesus goes to the lawyer, he goes, uh, who are these people that are doing this to me? And the lawyer goes, they're the Romans, but later they will become Italians. And if it matters in the future, they're gonna be way into you. They're really super into your birthday. And they're gonna put nativity scenes with your whole family on their front lawn. And if anybody messes with them, they'll flip out and it'll make the newspaper. And Jesus goes, Italians, huh? Well, how about this? Everybody in their ethnicity, all the men in their ethnicity have hair on their back for the rest of eternity. All their women have mustaches. All their kids live with their parents until they're 40. And when they do move out, they move next door. How's that? Is that fun? <laughs> Tell them it's from the King of the Jews. I called 911 for the first time. It happened in New York. I saw something and I said something. <laughs> what happened was I was walking through the park and next to the park was a car and inside the car was a man and inside the man's hand was his dick. <laughs> He was masturbating early on a Sunday morning. It was like he was the early bird jerking his worm. And I was concerned because there were kids running around and I was like, what about the children? I didn't call 911 immediately because I was on my way to brunch. <laughs> I had to address that first. I called the friend who I was meeting up with and I was like, hey girl, I'm gonna be a little late. There's a guy in the park with his dick out. And she goes, you've already used that excuse before. <laughs> okay, fair. But I was like, who do I call in this situation? I'm not aware of like a masturbation tip line. Although there should be one. Just the tips. <laughs> but like, is this a 911 situation? And she goes, I don't know, just hurry up, I don't wanna lose these seats. So we stopped talking. And then I called my mom, and I don't usually call my mom when there's a dick in front of me, but she is a woman who has lived, so she's probably encountered unwanted dick at some point in time. And I was like, mom, there's a man in the park with his dick out, who do I call? And she goes, I mean, he's not touching anyone or harassing anyone. Is there a level below 911? And the only thing I could think of was 311, <laughs> which in New York is the housing department. And I was like, he is pitching a tent, so. So I called them and I waited through this long automated message system that was like, 
do you have a problem with your landlord? Do you have a problem with your tenant? And I finally got a human on the phone and I was like, man in the park with his dick out. (laughs) And she goes, is this man your landlord or your tenant? (laughs) And I was like, neither. She goes, okay, we can't help you. She patches me through to 911. Meanwhile, this guy is still jerking off. I had three full phone conversations next to his car, and he's just doing him, literally. I get a 911 operator on the phone, and I'm like, man, park, dick. And she goes, is the suspect black or Hispanic? Those were the only two options I was given. Shortest multiple choice question I've ever had in my life. And I was like, are you kidding me? Like, this is where we're at? People keep saying we're in a post-racial society, and yet people keep thinking like this. How are we supposed to progress when authorities automatically assume that the person committing a crime is a person of color? That being said, he was Hispanic. (laughs) And then I was like, Well, now I don't want to snitch. (laughs) So I hung up. Because then I started feeling bad for him. And I was like, maybe he's just so stressed out from all the oppression he deals with every day in this country that he just needs... A release. And maybe jerking off in public spaces is his form of rebellion. He's saying, fuck the establishment by fucking himself. He's tired of the man beating him down. So he's beating his meat. He's carrying a heavy load. And he's taking matters into his own hands. We should all strive for that level of bravery. I went on vacation recently. I risked it all for a beach. (laughs) I went to Costa Rica with my best friend. Yeah, it was fun. And we stayed at a resort because we wanted to be in a different country, but like, not really. (laughs) And we wanted to go dancing one night. So we went to the concierge desk and we're like, we're gonna go dancing. Can you please call us a car? And we were talking to a staff full of men and they were like, You want to go out alone? You're just two women. Do you need a man to go with you? Should we send a chaperone to watch over you? And we're like, we're not going to prom. (laughs) We're just going to a bar, it's fine. But they wouldn't let it go. And then one guy behind the desk was like, I mean, I guess you have to learn your lessons the hard way. And I was like, is this the beginning of a porn? (laughs) Learn my lessons the hard way. I mean, I wasn't expecting this, but okay. (laughs) And it didn't phase us. We left, went dancing, found strangers, did their drugs and made it back safely. Because we're adults. But I thought about that moment and I was like, why wasn't I scared? I feel like me in my 20s would have been scared and been like, oh, we are just two women. Maybe we do need a man. But me today, I'm like, I dare you. (laughs) I dare you. I'm not worried to learn my lessons the hard way anymore because I've already learned all my lessons the hard way. I lived in New York for almost 10 years. I'm a woman in her 30s. If you're looking to scam me, you're too late. I have been scammed. At this point, I know all the tricks. I've been scammed out of money, sex, my time. Mostly from the same guy. (laughs) 
I used to live in Brooklyn, and I was at a local bar flirting with this guy, and we were giving each other, like, fuck me vibes. And I was like, okay, I think this is going to happen. But he kept doing all these, like, chivalrous transactional acts for the pussy. <laughs> and I wanted to be like, no need. <laughs> you got nothing but green lights here. We're good. <laughs> but he wouldn't stop. And I was like, okay, this is clearly for him. I'll just play along. And this will be like personal role play where I pretend to be somebody who's harder to get than she actually is. <laughs> I'll give it a try. <laughs> so we're flirting in the bar. Bar shuts down, and he goes, oh man, it's so late. I should probably walk you home, right? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> walk me home. I wouldn't want to learn a lesson. <laughs> and so he walks me home. We get to the bottom of my apartment building, and he goes, I should probably walk you upstairs, right? And I was like, oh my God, thank you. I always get so lost. <laughs> I'm terrible with directions. <laughs> Is it up? <laughs> so he walks me upstairs. And then we get to my living room and we're talking for a long time. And then eventually he goes, oh, wow, it is late. I should probably stay here for the night, huh? And I was like, uh-huh. And he goes, on the couch? And I'm like, okay. And then we're like making the couch, tucking the sheets in the cushions as if that's where he's gonna sleep tonight, <laughs> wasting everybody's time. <laughs> and then he tucks himself in the sheets <laughs> and he goes, oh, you know what I just realized? If your roommates come home and they see a stranger on the couch, they're gonna think I'm an intruder. I should probably sleep in your bed, right? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, man. <laughs> We are on the same team. We have the same objective. If you look at the board, this was the game plan the whole time. I even drew up a play for you to explode through the hole. Yes, get in my bed. And if your dick gets cold, you can use my pussy for warmth. So he got in my bed <laughs> and we started fooling around, but it didn't get very far because his dick wasn't working. And he goes, huh, too many margs. <laughs> and that happens. I was like, we'll try again in the morning. We wake up and I'm like, meh? And he goes, meh, I have to go to work. And then he leaves. And it took me a while to realize that he worked at a restaurant in Brooklyn and he lived an hour away in Harlem. So he just wanted to avoid the two hour commute and wake up closer to work the next day. Took me two years to realize that. I have been scammed. But I'm fine with this. I'm okay that I've gone through these things because this means I never have to experience these things again. Right? I've already lived through them and learned from them. And when they come up again, I know how to handle it better. For example, I was walking down the street by myself and this man approached me and he asked me for the time. I pulled out my phone, looked at it, looked back up, his dick was out. <laughs> Learned my lesson, I don't tell anyone the time anymore. <laughs> like, oh, what time is it? Time's up, that's what time it is. <laughs> but on the plus side, that guy who showed me his dick, same guy I saw jerking off in the park earlier. And I was like, look at you getting out of the car. Not letting the man keep you confined to your task faces. 
take it to the streets. A really strange thing happens to you um, when you become a father, which is that you just sort of drift into the background of your family and you become wallpaper. There's four members of my family and uh, I'm in fourth place. <laughs> Growing up, my dad would always say, I'm the LVP of our family. And I'd say, no, you're not. You're just a fucking drama queen. <laughs> but now that I'm a dad, I so get it. I so get it. My wife's happiness, my boy's happiness, it genuinely matters more to me than my own. As a father, your job is to pay for everything and shut the fuck up about it. <laughs> But it really dings your psyche to go from first place to last so quickly. It really messes with your head and that's why all of our dads were so fucking weird. <laughs> Everyone in this room's dad was so weird. <laughs> Growing up, my dad would get up every morning at 4 a.m. and take a bath. That's weird. <laughs> that's really weird. But now that I'm a father, I've never understood anything so much in my entire life. I'm like, Dad, yes, get your fucking bath time, dude. Because you know what never asked for a piece of bread with peanut butter on it, and then when you gave it to him, said that they didn't like peanut butter or bread? The sunrise never did that, and neither did that fucking bath. Here's my thing, here's how I've changed. Now that I'm a father, I can't talk to waiters fast enough. I just wanna dialogue with every waiter. I wanna see and be seen by waiters. And I was never rude before, but it was perfunctory. I was just trying to get the food or whatever. But now, I just wanna talk. That's how lonely I am. Like if I clean my plate, you know what I mean? Like I enjoyed the meal or whatever, and the waiter comes to retrieve it, I'm the guy now who's just like, guess I didn't like that at all. <laughs> like, what the fuck happened to me? I used to be kind of cool. Here's my move, here's my opening line with waiters, here's what I do. I'll go to, I'll say, uh, hey, what's good to eat here? Yeah, I put the ball on their court. Hey, what do you like to eat here? What a, what a culinary trust fall that is. You know, it's a thrill ride. Because you have to eat whatever they suggest after asking them, what kind of fucking maniac asks the waiter what's good to eat here and then summarily rejects whatever they say? <laughs> hey man, what's, what's good to eat at this restaurant? What do you like? Oh my God, out of all the restaurants I've ever worked at, the chef does the best fish and chips I've ever had in my entire life. Oh really? I'll get the BLT, you fucking idiot. <laughs> We're landlocked, Kenny. What is the chef, a wizard with frozen cod? Suck my dick. <laughs> the fuck out of here. But here's the thing, you don't even have to be at a sit down restaurant to pull that move. You can pull it anywhere if you're lonely enough. <laughs> the other day, I was at a Jimmy John's, I broke it out. At the kid working, I go, hey man, what's good, to, what's good at this Jimmy John's? <laughs> hey dude, <laughs> what do you like at this Jimmy John's? <laughs> he thought about it for a second, he was like, uh, the chips. <laughs> he couldn't think of a single sandwich he was willing to get behind, but he was all in on the chips and everyone in this room knows he's fucking right. Those chips are delicious. <laughs> They're crunchy, they're not too greasy, there's a lot of them. One bag of Jimmy John's chips is almost enough to make you forget about that photo of the CEO shooting an elephant. <laughs> Jimmy John's, where the secret ingredient is ivory. I'll do it again. Jimmy John's, where the secret ingredient is ivory. That's the teaser, that's the teaser. I could feel it. Chop it up, send it to Netflix. They'll be like, no thanks. 
that, that desire to be seen and recognized as a father, I don't think it gets better with time. I think just the opposite, it only gets worse. Because I was recently at an ice cream shop with my son, and we walked in, and the only other customers in the shop were some grandparents who had a grandchild about my son's age, and the kid working the register. And they were in line in front of us, and the, the little boy in line in front of us had to go to the bathroom, and the grandmother took him to the bathroom, leaving the grandfather alone, and it was this dude's time to shine. <laughs> and he looked to make sure that the door had shut. And we waited until it closed, and then he looked, he just leaned in, and he goes, you know, I used to work at an ice cream shop too. <laughs> yeah, Rhode Island, 1969. And the girl looked at him like, I'm 15 and don't understand what's happening right now. <laughs> and he goes, let me ask you something. My grandson, he's going to spill all down the front of his shirt and make a goddamn mess. You guys got a bib back there I could put on him, maybe try to salvage the situation a little bit. She's like, bibs? No, we don't, we don't have bibs. I could give you a hundred and possibly thin napkins. <laughs> and he was like, don't have any bibs. Don't have any bibs. Okay, all right, how about this? Do you have one of the necklaces with the two clips on either end that you could clip around a to-go cup and I could sort of rig around his neck like a horse with a feeding bag type scenario? <laughs> and me and the girl looked at each other like, what fucking ice cream shop did you work at? <laughs> that these were ever options at all. And then the grandma came out and he was like, oh, gotta go. And he like ran back. <laughs> back to the shadow that he exists in. And I so wish that that grandma had not emerged in that moment so I could have seen how batshit this was about to get. It's like, you don't have the horse feeding bag thing either? Okay, all right. How about this? You got one of them mesh sacks you can put five to seven to-go pints into and then string around your torso like a bandolier from the Spanish-American War? You don't have that either? Huh, all right, how about some uh, sprinkles in the shape of uh, various U.S. Navy ships? We'll just be on our way. No? Well then just have the kid come out from the back, sing as Jeremiah was a bullfrog, and we'll fucking go! I thought this was an ice cream shop! I thought this was an ice cream shop! And that's when I realized there's no fucking way this guy ever worked at an ice cream shop. He's just a weird old man who wants to talk to anybody. I could follow this dude around for days, and he would pull the same sad grift everywhere he went. I could see him the next day at a coffee shop. And he just leans in. He's like, uh, you know, I used to work at a coffee shop, too. Yeah, New Hampshire, 77. And back then, they didn't call us fancy baristas, neither. We were the Cup of Joe boys, and we didn't take any shit. <laughs> and let me ask you a question. You still do the promotion where if the customer rips off their shirt and you pour a scalding hot pot of coffee on their chest and they don't cry out in pain, it's free? Because I accept. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I used to be an astronaut too. Yeah, International Space Station, 88. And let me tell you something, it wasn't all kumbaya neither back then. If you saw a Ruski coming down the hallway, you ripped his helmet off and you shoved him out the exit hatch so his head would explode. Because he'd do it to you if you had half the chance. <laughs> January 6th. <laughs> He's at the Capitol. You know, I tried to overthrow the government once too. Yeah, Oregon, 91. And back then we weren't taking selfies at Nancy Pelosi's desk. We were writing manifestos and we were blowing up post offices. Now let's hang Mike Pence. You guys, call your grandpas. If you're not talking to them, Fox News is, and it's getting pretty weird. It's getting pretty weird. The best part of, of my day 
My favorite part of every day is bath time. It's dad's responsibility. I take it very seriously. We use the bathtub in our bedroom and uh, I put the boys on the bed. I go to our bathtub, I turn it on, strip off one layer of clothing, check the temperature, take the undies off, get the diapies off, go back, check the temperature one more time. The second I've turned my back on my two naked sons, <laughs> I turn back around and the three-year-old is desperately scrambling to get his nuts on the one-year-old's forehead. <laughs> And his little golem legs are scrambling. He's like, must find proper nut on forehead position. Which is crazy. I've never taught them about teabagging. He doesn't know how the internet works. He's done no independent research whatsoever. Yet somehow, instinctually, he's like, must assert dominance over smallest tribe member. Through nuts firmly on forehead, I am superior. And I hate it. I hate it so much. So the other day, I was like, you better cut that out. And my son goes, why? And the only thing I think to say was, uh, it's because you might have to borrow money from him someday. Hmm? Hmm? And my son goes, I thought you pay for everything. And I go, I do. But that's not always gonna be the case. And he goes, why? Do you get poor because people stop laughing at your jokes? <laughs> I was like, that's not what I was insinuating at all. But I mean, yeah, that is always kind of the fear, isn't it? People stop finding me funny, the whole gig's up, I can't afford for this lifestyle at all anymore. And he goes, why would people stop laughing at your jokes? And I go, I don't know. And he goes, do you think it's because they became a fan of you when you were one thing and then you just sort of morphed into this dad comedian they didn't really sign on for that shit? <laughs> I was like, Jesus Christ, dude. Nail on the goddamn head, yes. I never wanted to be one of these kids say the darndest thing comedians. But ever since I had you and your brother, it's like the only jokes I can write are about you too. And he's like, write what you know, right, Dad? And I'm like, fucking A, write what you know, exactly. <laughs> and I love that this is what I know. I wouldn't want to know anything else. It is such an honor being your guys' father, but still I just worry my comedy's becoming a little bit one note. My son goes, Dad. <laughs> your comedy couldn't be one note if you tried. I said, really? He goes, yeah. Look at the premise of this joke you're telling right now. You're carrying on a long conversation with a three-year-old. You've lost half the audience at this point. And I was like, oh, at least half. And he's like, yeah, but that half that's sticking around, they're on your every word, man. They wanna know how you're gonna land this plane. And I was like, I don't even know if I am gonna land this plane. And he's like, that's what's thrilling about it. It's risque, it's provocative, it's intellectual, it's surreal. I was like, are you kidding me? That's exactly how popular comedy blog The Laugh Button described my last album. He's like, I know, I read every word. He goes, Dad, let me ask you a question. I said, shoot, little buddy, anything. He goes, what's the meaning of life? I was like, fuck. That's heavy. And honestly, I don't, I don't know if I know. I know my trick. You want to know my trick? He goes, Dad, I'd love to know your trick. I said, you find what makes you happy in life, and you go at it with everything you got. And you don't waste your time chasing after the bad stuff in the darkness. It'll find you if it was meant to, and it will devastate you. Do not waste your time going after that. You find what makes you happy, you find the light, and you go towards it as hard as you can, and you do not let the sadness of this world outweigh the beauty that is everywhere if you just try to look for it. And my son goes, Dad, that's fucking profound. <laughs> He goes, Dad, you think your average comedy bro industrial complex comedian is giving their fans anything remotely that insightful? <laughs> I was like, no, I really don't at all. But I see this toxic masculinity podcast circle jerk and they're selling out theaters and I'm like, maybe I should say something edgy, put some butts in seats. And my son's like, don't you fucking dare. Don't you fucking dare, Dad. 
He goes, you keep doing what you're doing. You'll sell out theaters too. And even if you don't, at least you said something interesting the entire time. And I said, son, I'm, I'm just so glad we had this talk. <laughs> and he said, uh, me too, papa, me too. <laughs> I said, you know what? You can keep your nuts on your brother's forehead for two more minutes. <laughs> but then it's bath time, young man. I'm serious. So yeah, man, the suburbs, there, there's stuff that happens there. I, I, had a, I had a problem at this place called First Watch. It's a breakfast joint, you know, a tough place. And um, I go in there and they're like, it's a 20 minute wait. I'm like, okay, I can handle it. I'll do my time, you know, so. I'm sitting in the chair, I'm reading the paper, and I guess this woman came in after me and she had a baby, and you know, I didn't see her. If I'd have seen her, I'd have offered her my chair, but I didn't see her, so what she did, she just stood right next to me. She starts talking to her baby, but she's talking to me, all right? Like, <laughs> no, 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 there's no way for us to sit down. There's no way for us to sit down. There's no way for us. I'm like, oh, I'm sorry, ma'am, I didn't see you. Here, you, you, here. you, can, you can have my chair, you know? And then, you know, I, I stood right next to her. I didn't have a baby, all right? So I just started talking about a newspaper. I was like, nah, nah, newspaper, we gotta give her the chair. Nah, the tactic she's using, that's called passive aggressive newspaper. She's, uh, she's a gutless woman. Yeah, she, and she is using her infant child in this charade. She's miserable. I... afraid of an altercation. They're just, the suburbs are crumbling. They are. I saw this the other day. I saw a Domino's pizza being delivered to a McDonald's. That's not supposed to happen, okay? Like, <laughs> I get it. It was probably the kids that work at McDonald's got tired of eating hamburgers. Like, let's order a pizza. They should have told the guy to go around back. He was in line at McDonald's holding a pizza. It didn't look good. I mean, I, I get it. I get it. You guys been to McDonald's lately? Everybody that works there is a kid, everybody. I wanna to talk to your supervisor. We'll go get Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith's 15, all right? <laughs> we would go get our district manager, but his mom said he had too much homework. He can't come to work until next Thursday. <laughs> Customer service is gone. It doesn't exist, right? I mean, I just have a rule now. If, if, I, if I give you money, you just say thank you. That's it. You just say thank you, okay? And they don't do it. They don't say thank you half the time. I was in this place. Uh, and I gave him like 300 bucks. I paid 300 bucks for something, and the girl goes, hey, how did you hear about us? It's none of your business how I heard about you. Why don't you just be happy that I did hear about you? <laughs> Next time that happens, I'm just gonna make something up to throw them off their little marketing research. How'd you hear about us? Well, I belong to a lot of hate groups, and uh, <laughs> they told me I was supposed to shop here. They said for every dollar I spend here, 68 cents goes back to the hate group. All the hate groups, even my favorite hate group, the I hate the people that ask how'd you hear about us hate group. <laughs> How'd you hear about us? Japanese newspaper, full page ad in there. <laughs> Sir, we don't advertise in Japan. Well, I saw what I saw. Uh, you should be grateful, but that's not really your strong suit, is it? <laughs> I had another, this is probably like the, you know, the uh, toughest uh, issue. Um, I'll give you some background, okay? So my favorite snack is mixed nuts. That's, you know, I, like, I like mixed nuts. And like, when I eat mixed nuts, I don't have nine mixed nuts. I, I eat as many mixed nuts as I can until I'm very uncomfortable. <laughs> and then I have 11 more handfuls of mixed nuts. Like that's, <laughs> so I go to this, you know, I go, I was in the hotel and I go to the gift shop, I'm hungry, real hungry. And I see these, uh, I, see, I don't even see the whole package. I just read the muh and the uts, all right? I'm like, I want it. I, it looks like a, a good package, like experienced nut mixers or whatever. So I get it. I, I don't even look at it, I pay for it, don't look at it. I go up to the, the room, I don't even look at it, I start eating it, I'm, I'm watching TV, I'm just shoving handfuls in my mouth, and there's nuts in there, fine, but there's pistachios in there, fine, but they have shells on them. The pistachios have shells on them, and the rest of the mixed nuts do not have shells on them. That's wrong, isn't it? That's, that's dangerous, like that. Hey, thanks, could you also put some toy army men legs in those mixed nuts? That that's a, it's a, it's a crime. That's, and, and the thing is, man, like, it really bothers me because they're lazy. They are so lazy. Everybody knows pistachios, that's the easiest nut to take the shell off of. I mean, they, like, they hatch. Like, they, they hatch. Like, they, they hatch. Nature does 83% of the work for you. You just flick it, and they're open. 
I can understand if it's a walnut. You ever try to take a walnut shell off? It's, it's hard. Like, when you eat them at Christmas time, by the time you get one off, it's Valentine's Day. Like, that, 